So hello everyone, my name is Sandra Manninger. Together with uh, Matthias Del Campo, I run the architecture practice SPAN and I'm co-founder of uh, the REI lab, R lab. We will see what name we will come <laughs> up with at the end. So the laboratory for architecture and artificial intelligence at Topman College, uh, which runs in collaboration with Michigan Robotics and Computer Science Michigan. So um, let me just... So I'm uh, not one uh, who is being easily traced on social media. So before I start, I should probably mention that my interest in the implementation of computational tools has always focused on developing design protocols that are providing a body for the algorithmic procedures to manifest in order to extend our creative potentials and to be able to represent scientific and mathematical concepts of space. My own uh, history in exploring AI and machine learning started in Vienna. Uh, Vienna is home of the world's oldest cluster of research in artificial intelligence, the OFI, the Austrian Institute of Artificial Intelligence, an offspring of the Österreichische Studiengesellschaft für Kybernetik, uh, a registered scientific so society founded in 1969. About 30 years later, around 1994, I met Dr. Arthur Flexer, uh, who was then a student at the OFI and who first introduced me to the concepts of neural networks, his field of research. Uh, a couple of years later, in 2006, our office then conducted the first machine learning workshop in architecture at the Angewandte in Vienna in, co in co uh, collaboration with the OFI. And in 2011, I was invited to give a talk at their institute. Uh, but after moving to the University of Michigan, a collaboration with Michigan Robotics and Computer Science paved the way for a series of new design techniques. In particular, the, uh, the director of Michigan Robotics, Jesse Grisel, and PhD student Alexa Carlson have been pivotal to this collaboration. And I just wanted to give you a brief introduction about me because I'm so so uh, hard to being traced at social media. I'm not on Facebook and so so, so here you can see Arthur Flex on the left here, a good friend that I met in 1994 and he was pivotal in my uh, uh, introduction to neural networks and uh, in design field. So before I start, I would like to thank the lectures and events commit committee for the generous invitation to talk to the, today to you about aspects of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning and architecture design, and to present some of the projects and research that I've done in the past. Artificial intelligence is deeply embedded in our everyday life. Neural networks help diagnose medical cases, make decisions on bank loans, decide parole cases, read your bank checks, filter job applications, drive cars, fly drones, detect fraud, translate text online, and recommend to you which book to read next. They are part of our households in the form of quasi-intelligent thermostats and security systems, help finding our way in cars by using adaptive maps and are close to the human body in the shape of smartphones and watches. They recognize your face and the way you type and help uh, you photograph like a pro among other things. The da data generated by all these activities aid in perfecting the training of all these algorithms. In other words, AI is everywhere. And this is only the examples that we currently perceive as humans. The massive underbelly of artificial neural networks providing intelligent service managing copious amounts of data on servers, organizing the routes data takes, controlling traffic lights, managing shipping, subway schedules and many other mundane tasks elude our field of vision. So how does this ecology influence the field of architecture? First, we must distinguish between generalized AI and applied AI. General AI is an AI that can perform in a variety of ways, fulfilling a series of different tasks. Think data of Star Trek, the next gener generation, or agent mix from the uh, from the matrix. And that is obviously uh, most of the time the, tar the part that is uh, comes, uh, rightly so uh, critically uh, comes, uh, received and criticized. And then uh, there's the field of applied AI that is focused on one specific problem. For example, driverless cars that need to recognize the difference 
between a car and its environment, for example, a tree, a pedestrian, and so on. And machine learning, or ML, is part of applied AI, and this is actually the field, the tool sets or models we currently use in design and construction of the built environment are located. So how does this technology change the way we conceive, conceptualize, create, design, fabricate, construct, as well as maintain our built environment? How does it change the role of the architect? And how does it change the way how and what we teach? It is most certainly researched for its capacity as a tool for expedience. This is an example from research of the Technical University Munich, coming from the fields of computer vision and so-called digital twins, this machine learning model is being trained to recognize parts of a construction site, like columns or scaffolding, parts that then will be connected to a BIM model to collect projected and actual construction progress. But ML and an L, ML model can also be used as a tool for surveillance, like this older example from a research project of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University from 2017 where they are scientists observed individual workers' productivity. So I think uh, this example clearly shows that we as architects have to engage in this conversation. Before we can start to look for possible scenarios, we need to get to know the individual constituent elements of this technology to be able to employ them in a way that while using it for convenience, expedience, and service also empower new forms of creativity and go beyond superficial forms of so-called eco ecological design. So what are these constituent elements? Machine learning relies on the acquisition of copious amounts of data, whereby the data can be of any form or shape. In supervised learning, this data is being labeled or tagged. So each of these uh, sets or letters would be labeled as a three, as an eight. For some, you would probably have problems to distinguish is this a four or a seven uh, that is actually being trained. And in uh, unsupervised and reinforced learning, the model is trained to find hidden structures within the bulk of these data sets. So the second constituent uh, is a mathematical model with its corresponding loss function. And it's in its simplest form, this model can be a line or curve. So in its simplest form, we see here a regression model with just a line, a linear regression model. But in most cases, it is a multidimensional surface or tensor that either needs to go as close as possible to all data points or separates them into classes. So machine learning is actually a geometrical problem. And although the mathematical models do have weights and they also have a so-called bias, the actual bias that is being discussed and criticized in the realm of ML is the bias that is generated through the acquisition of data sets. And that is exactly where we as designers and architects engage with ML. Rarely will we be choosing the specific mathematical model, at least not in the beginning, but we will be asked to collect, train, and if necessary, label the data sets the neural network will, will be tested on. So here's an example from three students, Hannah Doherty, Mariana Moreya de Carvalho, and Iman Suleiman from the first thesis studio that I, that I taught in AI that used image classification with a convolutional neural network that was coded in Python. So here they were defining uh, target classes uh, and train a model to recognize them using labeled example photos. So the collected data set uh, consisted of approximately 1,000 images in each class. And the neural network then uh, will be extracting features from each image. But how can we use this now as a designer? When you look on the image stack in the middle of the first corner uh, column on the left, you can see a data set of images of 3D agglomerations in gray. So for many years, I have been developing a technique to very quickly create three-dimensional patterns and introduce this technique to my students in the Design Studio 2. So that proved to be very useful now. ML, ML models are mostly very data thirsty and rarely can a student create enough material in a semester, nor do they have a backstock of design to feed the algorithms. But with this technique and working in teams, 
uh, I could ask them to create an additional set of their own model images to be able to insert their own sensibilities and spice up their own work with uh, ML models. Usually before we introduce these new techniques to our students, we go through our own, own research and apply a variety of models to different data sets. Here, a neural style transfer with pre-trained weights seemed to be quite successful for the generation of landscape and urban conditions. Again, combining it with uh, my own or my or office's uh, sensibilities. So here, this city does not exist. It is generated by an algorithm using pre-trained weights that have learned on the famous ImageNet dataset that contains over 14 million labeled images. We are using these images to train the neural net to recognize distances between infrastructural elements population densities, scales of subdivision or block sizes, even building heights to integrate them later into BIM software, for example, to calculate wind loads or potential flooding. Here we applied a 2D style transfer model to create a series of plans and sections, and we are actually in the process of creating a new form of data set for more intuitive creation of plans. But to be honest, since working with computational tools and techniques, we always use three-dimensional and generative modeling. Our work was inspired by the amazing architecture of Ray Cappy, Frank Lloyd Wright, John Lautner, other flows, or in other words, the round plan or space plan rather than stacked for floor plans. Uh, if we wanted to integrate the quality of these architects and the ability of space into a neural network flow, we had to find different machine uh, learning models and even more laborious create our own 3D data set. This was the first attempt, a neural renderer model developed at the University of Tokyo. It is taking a 3D mesh geometry and a style image, adds texture to, so creates a new mesh. It was not yet what we were looking for, but a reasonable next step in this research. And we also had a special project with a very special client. These are two of them. We had been collaborating with Michigan Robotics for a year on studio projects and paper presentations. They asked us to design a robot test ground for the multi and bipedal robots. The robot garden needs to have a series of different geological features to test the robots. Sandy terrain, rocks, grass, earth, etc. We created a database with several thousand satellite images of various terrains to train a neural network to hallucinate these features on a given mesh model. In addition, we created several data sets of architectural features, such as fountains, columns, etc., and styles such as Gothic or Baroque. Playing with, the weight, uh, playing with the weights and we started to get a grip of how to use the technique until we got usable results. Making steps into the landscape was a requirement of the robotics lab, as well as the water feature, which will allow for flooding the robot garden to test the robots on slippery surfaces and in winter on ice. So here you can see the variety of models that we hallucinate to create features and some stills from the hallucination process. And an image from beautiful errors or glitches, that's the moment we are living for. <laughs> uh, but the first project we applied a neural render model was actually designed for the competition for the Austrian Pavilion for the Dubai Expo in 2020. It was our first successful AI-driven project. The ceiling of this project is a 2D to 3D style transfer acting between Baroque sensibilities as a style in a series of modern ceilings as the target. The result is a strangely articulated ceiling that oozes Baroque presence. The floor is intentionally kept modern to create a space full of intention between modern and Baroque sensibilities. The next work is based on a collaboration with Computer Science Michigan, who are using a powerful neural network architecture for machine learning on graphs. This was our first exploration to work directly on 3D meshes. The question was, can we collect 3D models from the hand of a designer, creating a large database of models in two distinct categories, houses and columns, in order to train a neural network to come up with additional model solutions that are generated 
using the learned features of the trained network. As said before, to create a design strategy that employs actual 3D geometry, we had to find the right model architecture and we even more so generate a data set of 3D models. This is a screenshot of a geometry created for, uh, of the geometry created for this data set containing around 1,500 labeled OBG mesh models of specific architectural classes, houses, and columns. It was the labor work of summer 2020. We refer to this data set as the sensibility data set. The next step is to train a graphic convolutional neural network on this data set to learn a mapping function between the Cartesian coordinate space of 3D models to our defined label space of sensibility features. And the final, and the next step is, um, and the final step is to um, placing the trained uh, uh, con uh, graph convolutional neural network in an optimization framework that takes in a user-specified 3D model as input and then deforms the vertices of this model to optimize the shape of a user-specified style, aesthetics or functionality label. So how can a neural network interrogate the inherent sensibility of a specific designer? So after our uh, research, we can assume that a model can, that we can model a designer sensibility as a high dimensional function that can be learned from 3D models and applied to generate novel design solutions. The design technique whose backbone is uh, graph CNNs is capable of modeling both the perception and creation of architectural objects. And you can read more about this project in the paper 3D Graph Convolutional Neural Networks, which uh, we presented at Acadia in 2020. And lastly, to see how these pieces are imp implemented our workflow in the office. In spring 2020, we were invited to participate in the international competition for the new 24 high school project in Shenzhen, China. The competition was for a large scale school for around 3,000 students and included next to classrooms an advanced technology fab lab, a public multi purpose building, a library, laboratories, PA building, dormitories, as well as outdoor sports facilities. In the months leading to the competition, we had been experimenting with attention guns, attentional generative adversarial networks that allow converting text to images. The competition seems like a perfect candidate to implement the research in a concrete project that had very specific requirements. The motivation to explore attention gun as a design technique in architecture can be found in the desires to interrogate an alternative design methodology, methodology that does not rely on images as a starting point for architecture design. But language. ATN uh, guns explore the information space present in programmatic needs expressed in written form and transform them into a visual output. This visual output can be further processed into three-dimensional models that transport lingual information into fully developed architectural entities. For the last two years, we have been trying to explore methods emerging from computer science that allow us to use neural networks in 3D. Instead of folding 3D into the two-dimensional plane of a 2D, 2D image and then unfolding, unfolding them back again into 3D, thus losing information in the process, we wanted to create a workflow that works entirely in 3D, thus resisting the Albertian paradigm in creating an abstraction of reality via plans, sections, and other methods of architectural representation. The ATN GAN process is still not in entirely 3D, but rather 2.5D. It was certainly fun exploring how a neural network would respond to a cue such the building is used for sports, is colorful, and has a crenellated crown, or the canary yellow building is a laboratory and is mocking the ground. However, this is not produced the final plans. This still needed quite some human intervention to work properly. So what does it mean if we are being assisted by tools that learn when we move from using expert systems to learning system, when we live with robots and machines, when we extend our senses through an added perception of the world. Can these tools extend our creative potentials and will they aid us in representing scientific and mathematical concepts of space? 
who will be the creator or advocate of data, the data we acquire and the data we produce, and who will be the participants in the design protocols that we are about to generate. These are the questions we discussed recently within the Neural Architecture Group. Matthias Del Campo and I started together with Daniel Bolochan and Emmanuel Po. And we discussed these topics also at the RV Lab, the Laboratory for Architecture and Artificial Intelligence, a collaboration with Taubman College, Michigan Robotics, and Computer Science Michigan. And I also take the opportunity to shamelessly refer to Matthias Del Campo's upcoming publication, Neural Architecture with Oro, that should be available end of this year. And also I have to apologize due to the bravery of this talk, I had to leave out a lot of technical details. If you want to know more about them, there's a series of lectures and tutorial videos on our YouTube channel. And that was it. Thank you very much.